Good morning. Welcome to Transfiguration Sunday. As a Sunday, with its own name, it's kind of odd. It's wedged here right before Lent. In three days, we are going to celebrate Ash Wednesday, so it becomes easy to, to look past this and everything that's coming with Lent and Easter coming up. It's also easy to look past this in the gospel itself. Our entire reading this morning was all of nine verses, and two of those were travel verses. They spent a verse going up and a verse coming down the mountain, so it's not a lot of space in the gospel. It can also feel a bit disconnected from everything else in the gospel. Jesus had been teaching and healing and wandering and then he went up on the mountain and he came down and he was teaching and healing and wandering. You know, it, uh, we don't immediately see what the effect that moment on the mountain had in the text. True, he told Peter, James, and John not to tell anybody, but nowhere in the text we read something like, and because Peter saw him on the mountain transfigured, da 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 happens and then it's kind of not ever mentioned again. So we need to be careful not to get distracted, not looking ahead in the text or into Lent or to Easter and overlook this powerful moment that happened, this moment that is filled with symbolism and images from the past. Now, today we are 2,000 years and some 6,000 miles away from when this event happened. And so the images and the symbols are kind of lessened for us. Right from the beginning of the text, we're reading where Jesus led them up a high mountain. And that should be sending off bells that something extraordinary is about to happen. Because in the Old Testament, if you wanted to encounter God, you went up on a mountain. Moses went up on a mountain, encountered God, and received the stone tablets with the law. Elijah went up on the mountain and encountered God in the small voice. And here those two figures appear in our text. Moses, the liberator who led them out of Egypt, who is considered the first prophet, and Elijah, who's considered one of the greatest prophets that ever was, are there on the mountaintop with Jesus. And then Peter speaks and starts talking about dwellings and tents and tabernacles. And we don't know why Peter starts talking about building dwellings. Perhaps he's doing it out of a sense of obligation to hospitality. These people need some place to stay. Right? The, the Ark of the Covenant stayed in a tabernacle. And on top of the ark is what's called the mercy seat. It's where God came and sat when he was among his people. So perhaps he wants to build them something like that. Perhaps he really does just want to capture the moment and make it extend forever and ever because this is a grand moment. Perhaps he is just human like the rest of us and in this grand moment he is simply overwhelmed. And when we are overwhelmed, we have a tendency to do something, to do anything, just to do. We don't know what's going on. Peter has a prob probably forgotten the line in the psalm of simply, be still and know that I am God. We need to be careful not to turn today's text into an, oh, Peter moment. It's easy to fall into that habit. Peter has this habit of opening his mouth and inserting his foot. And so anytime we see Peter in a text, we have a tendency to go, oh, Peter. We turn lessons into oh, Peter moments. We turn Peter into the comic relief of the gospel, the one person you can count on to say or do the wrong thing at the wrong time. And when we do this, we dishonor Peter. This was a man who was, he, when he was imprisoned and sentenced to death by Herod, 
an angel of the Lord appeared and led him to freedom. This was a man who gave an impromptu sermon in Jerusalem and converted 3,000 people. This is a man who Jesus himself declared, upon this rock I will build my church. Does this man sound like a comic relief character to you? Worse, when we take the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ, and turn it into the old Peter moment, we end up turning it into a PSA of don't be like Peter. Here we have Jesus revealed in all his glory, his face shining. We have a glimpse into the kingdom of heaven. But how often do we just want to talk about Peter? 2,000 years after this event, this transfiguration, this moment can still overwhelm us. We're not sure what to do but we know we need to do something. So we talk about Peter. And we forget to just be still and know that I am God. Because Peter's talking is not the end of the story. For while he is talking, a cloud appears. And a voice comes from the cloud. And it gives us the same message we heard when Jesus was baptized. This is my Son, the Beloved. With Him I am well pleased. Only this time, we get a new instruction tacked on to the end. Listen to Him. A simple instruction. Listen to Him. But how often can we make that simple instruction complicated? Right? How am I supposed to listen? When am I supposed to listen? For the last several weeks, we've been listening and reading about this Sermon on the Mount. That's already happened by this time. Am I supposed to go back and listen retroactively somehow? Or am I only supposed to listen to what comes next, the, the rest of the stuff in, in the Gospel? Am I supposed to only listen to that stuff and not the stuff that's already happened so much? Or maybe this is just an in general listen to him. Just, oh, he's important. Listen to him. We can take something simple and make it complicated. But perhaps with today's reading, we need to take this very literally. Peter, James, and John have fallen on their faces in fear and awe of this voice from the cloud. They are lying there on the ground. This voice tells them to listen to him. Jesus comes to him, to them, touches them, and says, Get up and do not be afraid. Is that what they are supposed to listen to? Is that what we are supposed to listen to? Recently, I have begun to suspect that this one phrase by Jesus is one of the most powerful yet underrated bits of instruction in the gospel. Get up and do not be afraid. There's an acknowledgement in that. Acknowledgement that we will be overwhelmed. But Jesus tells us, get up and do not be afraid. The world will try to beat us down. It will try to wear us down. And will try to keep us down with heavy burdens. But Jesus comes to us and says, Get up and do not be afraid. We will lose our way. We will stumble. We will fall. But Jesus tells us, Get up and do not be afraid. No matter how lost, we might be, no matter how broken we think we are, no matter how overwhelmed in the moment we might be, Jesus comes to us and tells us, get up and do not be afraid. Amen.